Welcome to Aspen Ignites, Conversations to Build a Better World, a series from the Aspen Institute that brings together thoughtful people with diverse backgrounds and points of view. In today's episode, Vivian Schiller, Executive Director of Aspen Digital, spoke with Vox senior reporter Seagal Samuel about what the future holds for artificial intelligence. Hi, Vivian. It's really nice to be here with you today. Oh, thanks, Seagal. Likewise. Great. So we're going to talk a little bit about AI, artificial intelligence. And the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, we just hear about AI constantly nowadays. It's everywhere in the media. There's so much hype. It's hard for everyone to keep up. Lawmakers, you know, journalists, even journalists like myself who cover AI. What, you know, how much of this is hype? What actually has the potential here for transformative change? Wow. Well, that's a big question. Um, first of all, I completely agree agree with you. The hype is absolutely out of control. Yeah. Um, and you have everyone from, you know, people saying sentient robots are going to, you know, completely overrun the earth, you know, in two years time uh, to those who say really just there's no issue here. Don't worry about anything. And then my preference is the people uh, somewhere in the middle who are like, you know what? Yes, AI, especially generative AI, has significant consequences, but they're actually about the right here and right now. And they have nothing to do with sentient robots. Just unpack for me a little bit what you mean by AI in general, and specifically generative AI. What yeah, is that exactly? It's, it's really complicated. So artificial intelligence is a ridiculously broad term, and it refers to a set of technologies that have been around for many, many decades. There is absolutely nothing new a bit about AI. What most people are obsessed with right now is generative AI. So generative AI, as the name implies, is um, technology that can generate content. So it can generate um, text, it can generate um, photos or videos or audios based on LLMs. Your, people are going to hear the term LLM a lot, and that stands for large language model. And a large language model is basically a collection of everything that's on the internet, basically. And those large language models are used to train uh, generative AI tools to, um, to create what the technology, what, what replicates what it has seen in crawling this massive amount of data across the web. And, but that's what people are focused on right okay. now. And the reason it's so crazy, if it feels like it's so crazy in the last six, seven months, it's because on November 30th, of 2022, mark it in the calendar, chat GPT launched. Yep. And again, even though it's not a new technology, it was first time that we civilians were able to feel and see what it's like to so easily create text. Right. And in addition to chat GPT, we also got a taste for what we can do with images, right? Through things like Midjourney or Dolly 2, yes. which are generating images that look often pretty convincing, like, yeah. like like it's a real photo, right? Right, exactly right. So those are all, so that's also generative AI, being able to make photos and you can, you know, put in any prompt you want, you know, show me a horse, uh, you know, show me a pic, an image you can type in, show me an image of a horse in a, in the style of a Hanna-Barbera uh, cartoon, but it's in medieval dress and it will deliver that. Uh, of course, the flip side to that I suspect we'll get into is it can also generate um, images that are of real people in situations that they were never in. And that's where it gets problematic. Totally. I want to ask you first, you know, I'm just thinking about illustrators here or photographers, right? Or even writers with ChatGPT. These technologies seem like they might threaten certain jobs. Yeah. We've had, you know, in the 20th century, we had unemployment due to different kinds of technologies. We had, you know, manufacturing with AI, there's a lot of talk about, you know, AI is coming for our jobs. There's going to be mass unemployment. How, how, to what extent do you think that's true? Like, like most things in life, it's complicated. Um, certainly there will be an impact um, on jobs. Um, not all bad. There will be new categories of jobs that are created. Uh, we don't know yet. I mean, you started your question by talking about um, people that generate content for a living, mm -hmm. whether that is journalists like ourselves, or whether it is, um, like you said, photographers or any kind of artists. And certainly there is a lot of risk there because it is so much easier to create content. Um, but particularly when it comes to words, it's easy to create content that sounds right, 
but it is full of what um, the tech industry calls hallucinations, which is a fancy word for um, stuff that just ain't true. Made up. It's made up. <laughs> made up stuff. We'll keep it clean. Yep. <laughs> so you were hinting a moment ago about, you know, the ability of these AI models to generate images that look really convincing. And they're of images of real people, but they're actually fake. This brings to mind, you know, people might remember the Pope in the puffer jacket. Yeah. Spectacular right. image. It was, it, I mean, the Pope looked cool. He looked it really looked, cool. It looked I great. get one. <laughs> totally. But, you know, and that, that kind of went viral and some people just, you know, uncritically believed. And I don't blame them. It's pretty convincing. You know, as journalists, what do you think is our role in trying to vet um, these kinds of AI generated images or deep fakes? Yeah. How, what, what methods or what tools do you think we should be using? Yeah. It's a great question. And I think, um, deep fakes or synthetic media or whatever name you go. I think there is a short-term challenge, but I think there's actually a much more profound challenge that's yeah. coming right on the tails of that. The short-term challenge is exactly what you said. People will look at this image and believe it's true. Now, the Pope in a puffer jacket doesn't really have any consequence. Uh, other images can have serious consequence. You may recall um, not that long ago, there was an image of what looked like an explosion near the Pentagon that was completely false. And I think it, you know, freaked people out for a few minutes until they were able to figure out that it wasn't true. And creating these images, and particularly video and audio of people saying things they never said, is particularly nefarious. And it will be the role of the news media to very quickly um, get on those uh, images and fact check them and put information out to the public. My bigger concern is that I think once people get used to the fact that there's so much fake stuff out there, the bigger risk to me is not that they will believe all the nonsense, is that they will stop believing anything they see, totally. including legitimate photographs from photojournalists, including from, you know, heads of state saying things they actually said or any, any kind of images that are true. And there's actually a name for this phenomenon. It's called the liar's dividend. And the liar's dividend is when distrust of all content becomes so pervasive that people just give up. Mm. And this is a tool for autocrats mm. because it is, look, our, our former president in discrediting, um, in, in discrediting the news media, this is wonderful. He can say, don't believe anything. That tape, you think you heard of me talking about these classified documents? It was fake, don't believe it. Mm -hmm. People will stop believing anything and they will retreat into their bubbles and just become more entrenched in their camps. That scares me the most. Me too. I mean, my uh, great grandfather used to say, believe none of what you see and only half of what you hear. Yeah. And I think we're already in a moment when people are starting to distrust, you know, what they see, what they hear, the media in general. What can we do? What is the antidote yeah. to this? Yeah, it's a great question. Your, your great grandfather was a very wise man. Um, I, you know, I wish I had a great answer. Um, you know, because in, even though I'm um, a, a recovering journalist, in my heart, I'm always a journalist. So, you know, just as, you know, a hammer sees everything as a nail, I think the answer to everything is more journalism mm -hmm. um, to fill that void, to flood the zone, the kind of work, wonderful, incredible work that Vox is doing and so many others. Um, so I think we need more of that and we need to build up the resiliency across the country so that people can learn which sources they can trust. It comes back to the tried and true, which is, what are the news organizations, who are the news organizations you can believe? Mm. And, you know, in a flood of, you know, synthetic media and in a flood of all these pink slime sites and all these garbage, you know, uh, sites or, you know, radio shows that are spewing lies, trying to help reinforce um, legitimate fact-based press information rooted in the evidence-based world is going to be more and more important. I'm just thinking of, you know, there's there's talk among some social scientists that that it's a fallacy to think that, you know, when people are believing something untrue, you know, just just throw more facts at them, more information. Right. There's an yeah. information deficit. And we we see that, like, unfortunately, that's not right. really how it works in, in people's psychology. And so I wonder, you know, do you think that we need to take a different approach and instead maybe teach, you know, teach the public, maybe in schools even more critical thinking skills, critical engagement yeah. with media. Yeah, well, there's, there's, you know, again, th yes, this kind of media literacy is critical, but that is a long-term solution. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got a lot uh, ahead of us before new generations with more critical skills can, can come of age. 
Uh, but you're absolutely right. Just throwing facts at somebody, saying you're wrong, is, is proven to be not effective. In fact, so many of the conversations that are happening here at the Aspen Ideas Festival are about how to talk across differences, how to listen with empathy, how to um, engage with somebody who has a different belief system or maybe doesn't believe in things that are true, that rather than just shut them down and yell at them and say, this isn't true and here are the facts, is to try to understand where they're coming from and then um, build some trust and bring them around to the potential for a different point of view. Mm -hmm. That is hard work. It is not easily scalable, but we have a crisis in this country of trust. We have it outside the United States too, but let's focus on the United States and we just have to do the hard work. And what about, you know, as journalists, how should we be permitting ourselves or not permitting ourselves to use um, these AI models in producing journalism? You know, I think in probably all newsrooms now, yeah. there's talk of, can we use ChatGPT? Is that is that okay? Yeah. Like, what can we use it for? What can't we use it for? I don't know. What is your view on that? I'm glad you asked that because you know, even in this conversation, we it, it, we tend to sort of demonize artificial intelligence when, in fact, you know, we could spend you know the next hour talking about all the great promise of AI for you know drug discovery for solutions to the climate crisis, all kinds of things, um, and in fact, AI has many uses. I think even in the newsroom. Um, they can, for example, yes, you talked about ChatGPT. I think it's perfectly fine. ChatGPT is actually great if you're kind of want to, you're brainstorming angles on a story. Totally. Um, or even doing a first draft. You just, because you're a journalist, you of course live by this. You just can't take it as the gospel. But, uh, but it's a great tool. It's like a, it's a reporting buddy. Think of it that way. Mm. But there's other really extraordinary ways that I think news organizations will start to experiment with that will also, um, be great tools for their audience. For example, there's one news organization, you know, for, you, you guys do live blogs of big breaking news events. Well, the problem with live blogs is you come in in the middle and you're not really sure what's going on because you have no context. Mm -hmm. uh, bots, AI bots can be created so that for the individual user coming into the live blog, it can give you a summary of mm -hmm. everything that's happened to date based on your own reporting, not mm -hmm. something taken off the internet. What an amazing tool. Another really exciting opportunity around AI um, for consumers is personalized news. There are experiments now that can create basically sort of personalized radio shows. So, um, so for instance, Vivian Schiller is driving to work. It knows me. It's giving me news from legitimate news organizations like Vox of what it knows that I'm interested in. It's also giving me the weather in my neighborhood and it's telling me the traffic on my route to where I'm going. I mean, that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like maybe there's some potential for AI to really help us with our journalism in terms of someone comes, a, a reader comes in, they need context, they can just click on a certain link, yeah. say, explain this to me, give me the background on this, uh, or define this for me. Right. Um, do you think that if we use something like ChatGPT to help us, um, not just with brainstorming examples or angles, but actually with the writing of an article? Should we disclose that? Is, should there be some kind of watermark or disclosure? Mm -hmm. I think if you're, you know, look, I, journalism is rooted in disclosure so I th and transparency, so I think there's no harm in doing it. Mm -hmm. But as we've discussed, no news organization should use the output of a chat GPT and publish it. As uncritically. If. Right, uncritically. So it's fine to say it's assisted in the reporting, but you would never want to publish something straight out of... Uh, out of ChatGPT. Right. And in fact, even the examples we're talking about before, we're summarizing what's happened to date in a live blog. That would be based on information from your own blog that's already been there. You're not pulling random stuff off the internet. Right. You mentioned a second ago also opportunities that, you know, things that AI might be able to help us with that are, you know, really, really major, like climate crisis. What do you think are the biggest potential opportunities here? I mean, there's so many um, opportunities. Like I said, the kind of um, personalized education is one. Mm -hmm. In the same way we talked about personalized news report for me, um, right now, you know, AI is being demonized in education because there's all this, you know, people are wringing their hands about, you know, the college essay and, you know, how kids are going to use ChatGPT and get wrong information. That's bad use of AI for education. Mm -hmm. But a good use for AI education, it's not necessarily ChatGPT, there are many, many other tools, is to create personalized uh, learning tools for kids based on their particular needs and where they are that can grow with them, that can adapt as they move on to level and level. That's really exciting. Um, would that be something like what the Khan Academy is doing with yeah. sort of having this like AI tutor? Yeah, they're experimenting with that as are, as are many others. And I think we're really just at the beginning of the kind of ways that AI 
can improve many things in, in all walks of life. I'm curious also what you think about the somewhat more, you know, doom and gloom um, aspects that we hear about in the media. You know, you have people talking about AI risks, not just, you know, oh, what will it do to public trust and media, but potentially existential risk. What is your yeah. feeling about that? Is I, that hype? Is that... I get frustrated about that. And the reason I get frustrated about it is because it jumps right over all the other problems that are with us now. So we already know right now, big big risks from AI is, as we've discussed, the pollution of the information ecosystem, the um, bias and discrimination at scale. Don't forget that AI tools are based on the vast repository of everything on the internet. And guess what? A lot of that is racist, sexist, uh, transphobic, and what have you. So it's going to spit out that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a big risk. What is going to happen with jobs? Do we have training? These are all problems that are, are huge problems in the next three to five years and beyond, you know, yes, I know there is, there's a concept known as um, AGI, artificial general intelligence, and that's sort of the stuff of science fiction. Is it coming? Yes, it's coming. It's real where, you know, these AI tools will actually be able to use human logic. Could those, you know, there's been a lot of talk here at the Aspen Ideas Festival of, uh, you know, these AGI tools, once they get so sophisticated, in order to talk to each other, they can create their own language that we won't understand. And then what's going to happen? And, oh, my God, it's the end of humanity. I I'm not ready to freak out about that yet. Some people, you know, when letters come out from technologists, even, you know, people like Sam Altman at OpenAI, um, people at DeepMind, people at the top AI firms, uh, and they're warning, trying to warn the public, you know, about existential threat and so on. Sometimes, you know, critics come and say, that's actually just those AI people, like, doing PR for themselves. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you subscribe to that yeah. view? I, I, I agree with that view. Um, look, like most, like most things have a grain of truth in them, right? So I, I'm not saying that, they're com that some of their concerns are wrong. On the other hand, um, it is to the advantage of big tech incumbents to protect their incumbency. And you protect your incumbency by saying, it's a scary world out there. Mm. We got it. We have rules. Just trust us. Smash all those little uh, upstarts that might come and eat our lunch someday because you can't trust them. So there is no small amount of self-interest there for sure. Is it, is it a little bit like some politicians who say, you know, it, it's a scary world out there. You can't trust anyone else. Just follow me. I'll be your leader. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. This is, this is, you know, this is a human attribute that goes back to the beginning of humanity. One last question for you. What do you think is the role here for regulation, for law to step in? Should we potentially be trying to actually slow down AI progress or put other curbs or guardrails? Yeah. There's a, the short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer, of course, like again, is it's complicated because you know when you look at uh, stopping something that's right in, in front of you, it's easy to ignore uh, downstream effects. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be very, very careful about the kinds of regulation in a on AI. And also, there are, it's a, there are a lot of laws on the books right now. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily need to create new laws in order to protect um, our environment from, you know, a, abusive bias and discrimination and, and other harms of AI. Those don't need new rules and laws. There are rules and laws on the books right now that can be applied. So, but yes, and in fact, one of the things we at Aspen Digital are doing are deeply engaging um, with civil society groups, private industry, and members of Congress um, on how we think about smart approaches to regulation. This is, this is an ongoing conversation. It begins with making sure that um, everybody involved is educated on what AI is and isn't, and sense making is just such an important part of that. And I do have to put in one little plug, um, which is at Aspen Digital, we have created um, a set of primers about AI. They're actually intended for journalists uh, because we did a set of roundtables with journalists all over the country about what to cover. We created these AIs based on the, com I mean, sorry, these primers, they are not AIs, <laughs> these conversations that we had, and we've published them at techprimers.aspendigital.com. Dot org. And they're not just for journalists, they're for everybody. Techprimers.aspendigital.org. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you so much, Sagal. Great talking great. to you. You too. Thanks.